I've titled today's message, Becoming the One. And some Star Wars fans might think, ah, yes, I could hear Yoda saying that. Become the one you must. But, but really what I want us to talk about is God is looking for individuals that will respond to the unexpected in a way that anticipates God wanting to do something bigger than them. And that's really what I want to look at today. Um, what do you do when you are faced with the unexpected? Because in reality, your response kind of tells a lot about your character and who you are. Some people, when, when the unexpected comes knocking at their door, they hide under the covers hoping that they'll assume they're not there. Or they'll withdraw. Others will respond in faith and gather people around them. But the fact of the matter is, the unexpected comes to us all of the time. We won't be able to control it. Sometimes the unexpected is minor, and other times unexpected is life-changing news. But our response to the unexpected needs to remain consistent because that's what enables us to be used by God to move from the ordinary to the extraordinary. It is the individuals who choose to make a difference in the face of the unexpected that stand out and become the one to make a difference in their life and the life of others. Both secular history and biblical history are full of stories of individuals who did just that. We go to school and we, we learn about individuals that stood up against society and made a difference. Uh, we, we've heard about Gandhi and we've heard about Nelson Mandela and, and we've heard about the likes of different world rulers who kind of changed the tide and turned situations because when the unexpected happened, they responded when nobody else wanted to respond. This morning, I want to I look at some individuals that are less famous, less notable, but nonetheless, they had major impacts. Because what I want to avoid is anyone thinking, yeah, yeah, he can do it, but not me. Because God, God is encouraging all of us to stand up and to become the one that believes in him for what he wants to do. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to start with a short video of a couple of kids who, when they saw something that was different, when they saw something that was unexpected, they had a very extraordinary response. Very, very early on in our work, uh, there was a brother and sister who had to share the same pair of shoes. One would go to school one day, and the other would stay at home, and the next day they'd switch. And to make it even worse for the boy, it was a pair of pink sparkly shoes that he'd have to wear to school on his days to go to school. So he was getting bullied a lot and really didn't want to go to school. Once they both got their own shoes, they could both go to school together. He wasn't being bullied as much. He was happy to go to school, you know? The fact that just a pair of sneakers could have such an impact on someone and, and their outlook, I think that's enormous and it was really amazing to be able to do that. I think that's really the importance of the work that we do. It's helping kids be their best selves. I'm Nicholas Loinger and I am the founder of Gotta Have Soul. Gotta Have Soul donates brand new sneakers to kids in homeless shelters to open up opportunities for them. We provide them with the shoes they need to get to school and the skills they need to succeed when they're there. My mom is an art therapist and when I was very little, about five years old, she brought me to a homeless shelter and she did that right after we had gotten a brand new pair of sneakers for me. And here I am in my brand new sneakers seeing kids who are barefoot or wearing really tattered shoes. And as a five-year-old, that was pretty mind-boggling, and so I wanted to do something about it. So I started Gotta Have Soul when I was 12 years old, and we've been growing ever since. My grandma always says, when life hands you lemons, make lemonade. I didn't know what this meant until I heard about Alexandra Scott. When Alex was four, she set up a lemonade stand in the front yard. Her idea? To give the money to doctors so they could help find a cure for kids like her with cancer. Alex left us in 2004 when she was just eight, but not before her idea inspired others and raised over a million dollars towards cancer research. 
Today, Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation continues to carry out the work that she began. Kids can set up their own stand to raise money, just like Alex did. Two individuals who at a young age saw something that didn't seem right to them. And they decided to make a difference. The first pair of Snickers that Nicholas gave away was to that, that family. And, you know, he did something small that became something big. Ale Alexandra, at the age of five, just finishing having massive cancer treatments, told her mom, I want to open up a lemonade stand. And her parents kind of entertained the idea, but they weren't expecting anything to come from it. And they're like, well, Alex, what do you want? What is it that you want to buy so bad that you need to sell lemonade? She goes, oh, it's not for me. It's for the doctors so they can find a cure for cancer. Both these individuals faced unexpected circumstances, but they didn't do what your typical child would do. Look away and continue with life. They made a difference. Well, God's calling us to do something similar in our lives and in our journey of faith. When we surrendered our life to Christ, we put our faith in him. And in doing so, we said, I want to make a difference. So this morning, I want us to jump in and see how an unlikely outsider responded when the unexpected came knocking at our door. And we're going we're gonna to spend our time this morning in Joshua chapter 2. Really the start of one of the most exciting times in Israel's history where they, they begin to occupy the land that God promised to give them. They're still on the other side of the Jordan River in, in Joshua chapter 2, but they're preparing. Joshua has been placed in charge of, of Israel, and this is kind of his first act that he does as their new ruler. It says in Joshua chapter 2 and verse 1, And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. Now, one thing that I find very interesting here, um, Moses sent out 12 spies earlier, and we're given all the names of the spies, and we're given the details about the spies. In, in Joshua chapter 2, it's two unknown men. If you were watching the news today, it would be two government contractors secretly went in, and you would never know their names. Why are their names not mentioned? Because the story is not about them. They were sent on a mission, but they were about to meet somebody, and the whole chapter 2 is about one individual who was an outsider, who was not even an Israelite, but her response to the unexpected would change the situation, not only for her, but for other people as well. Continuing in verse 1, it says, And they went out and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men that have come to you, those who entered your house, for they have come to search out the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, true, the men did come to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to close at dark, the men went out. I don't know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax. And she had laid an order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan, as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. There's a couple of things that I want, I want to talk about, and we need to keep in mind when we're discussing fear, because right now we want to look at how we turn our fear into faith. How do we turn our fear into faith? Um... I've observed that people often respond in one of two ways to the unexpected. They respond with fear. Oh, no, what am I going to do? Oh, I, I don't know. Or they respond in faith. One response pleases God. The other response often leads to actions that do not please God. Think through your life when you've responded out of fear. How often have you made the right choice? But in the times that, that you respond out of faith, you look back and you see how that was the right choice. 
Those who choose to respond in faith position themselves to make a difference, not only in their life, but in the life of others. I want us to understand, and I want to be clear, fear is the opposite of faith. Sometimes we might try to hold on to both. God, I trust you want to do this, but I need to hold on to this over here. That's not responding in faith. That's allowing fear to control and limit our actions. All right? God needs us to let go of what we're afraid of and embrace his faith so that we can do what he needs us to do. And coping with your fear is not the same as conquering your fear. All right? we, we live in a world where they teach you, if you're afraid of the dark, turn on a nightlight, which is fine. But that's not conquering your fear. That's simply coping with your fear. If you're afraid to be alone, then don't be alone. If, you, if you're afraid to drive, then get an Uber. But see, God doesn't want us to just cope with our fear. He wants us to conquer our fear. When, when I was looking at this and I was studying, I, I began to think, how often in my life have I allowed a coping mechanism to keep me from faith? Instead of putting it, it all forward to God and saying, God, I believe you have this. I say, God, you have this, but I make plans to take control of it. Because I'm afraid to give up control. But see, it's when we surrender to God and we release our fears that we're able to embrace faith with both hands and see a change take place. So how do we, how do we turn our fear into faith? Let's look at verses 9 and 10 of Joshua chapter 2. First thing we have to do if we want to turn our fear into faith the F in fear is for face the facts, all right? We need to look at the facts and not the unknown. And here is Rahab talking to the spies after she's diverted the soldiers. She says, I know the Lord has given you the land, fact number one. I know the Lord has given you the land. She goes on, and that the fear of you has fallen upon all of us. Everyone in the city, they're afraid of you. And then she goes on to talk about the story she heard. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. All right, if we want to face our fear, we need to face the facts. All right, the unknown does not determine our outcome. The facts determine our outcome. Facts are a truth known by actual experience or observation, something known to be true. And when you face a truly desperate situation, it calls for desperate action. Think about Rahab for a minute. She'd heard about the stories. They'd been circulating for some time, but now it was evident the Israelites were about to invade. These are facts. And then she wakes up one day, and there's a knock on her door, and as she opens the door, the unexpected happens. Two Israelites are standing there, face to face with the unexpected. She's already said, everybody is, is tied up in fear. And at this moment, she has to make a decision. Will she allow, will she allow her fear to control her future, or will she exchange her fear for faith and put her trust in the God who made heavens and earth. Out of all of the inhabitants of Jericho, it was Rahab alone who was ready to turn her fear into faith. So if, if we want to face our fear, we start by facing the facts. Keep the facts. Keep what is known sure. The E in fear is examine your circumstances. If you want to face the fear, you need to examine your circumstances. When we examine our circumstances, we look at what we can control and prioritize it accordingly. All right? We don't look at what we can't control. I know, I, I'm guilty there. I want to control things that are outside of my control. But what God wants us to do is he wants us to examine our life and he wants to see what can we do about the situation. What can we do to make a difference or to make a change? Rahab was not satisfied with her knowledge of God. 
She wanted to experience him firsthand. Rahab felt so strongly about the God of the Israelites that she was willing to commit treason. She was willing to betray her people to embrace God and his plans and purposes for the land. She stood out amongst everybody else. She faced her fear. She examined her circumstances. In verse 4 and 6, she talks about all the situations that she had to face. And, and, she, and what she had to do to overcome those things. The next thing, the A in fear, is for she had to act accordingly. It's not enough to face the truth or face the facts. It's not enough to, to um, examine your priorities. But there comes a time where if you're going to do something, you have to actually act on it. All right? Dreaming is good. Talking is good. But eventually it has to translate into some form of action. And sometimes we're thinking that it has to be this grandiose, this huge action that we take to make a difference. But it can be as simple as giving a pair of shoes to a child. It can be as simple as going out of your way to make sure that somebody knows that you value what they do and they make a difference. That one action can put forth in place something much larger. I have found in my own journey of faith that it's the little things that lead to the big things. God wants us to be faithful with what we can do today to make a difference, and then tomorrow will take care of itself. What is God calling us to do? We have to act accordingly. Her desire to change her circumstances led to her taking extraordinary risks. Rahab was willing to risk everything to help the spies. She hid them on her roof. She kept them in her house. If they were found her life would have ended even sooner, all right? She diverted the soldiers when they came, when they're beating on her door. Bring out those men. We know they came in here. We need to see them. They don't mean good to us. She diverted the spies. And then she helped the spies to escape. She lowered them out her window down the city wall once it was safe. She told them where they needed to go and to hide out for a couple days so that they could be saved. She acted accordingly. How is God calling you to act today? Think about that. What small or large step is God asking you to do? What I want us to notice, nowhere in Joshua chapter 2 do we see the spies asking or expecting Rahab to help. She just did it. Why? Because she wasn't going to be controlled by fear. She was tired of the feeling of fear. She was tired of the feeling of hopelessness. So she was willing to exchange all of that and put her hope and faith in God. The R for fear stands to resolve. You have to resolve to be the one. You have to make the difference. I'm not going to wait for somebody else. I'm not going to wait for somebody else to catch the vision or catch the dream. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to do what I can do now. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 31, the, the, the hall of faith of the New Testament that records everything that great people in the Old Testament do, that did, it says this, By faith Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Your resolve becomes part of your testimony. Your resolve becomes part of your testimony. Rahab is remembered because she did not respond in fear, she responded in faith. And your testimony is your key to overcoming. Your testimony is your key to overcoming and becoming the one who makes a difference. The testimony of Rahab turned the Israelites' uncertainty into faith. Now, I want us to notice... All the stories that Rahab told were stories that had happened 40 years ago. The crossing of the Red Sea. The feeding of the kings of the Amorites. And for approximately 38 years, they've been watching these Israelites camped on the other side. The stories that gave her faith were the stories that the original 12 spies lived out. Those 12 spies walked on the dry land that God parted for the Red Sea. 
Those 12 spies saw the defeat of the Amorite kings. Those 12 spies saw water flow from a rock. Those 12 spies saw food miraculously provided day after day. But when they went into the promised land, they saw something they did not expect. They saw giants and they responded in fear. And they came back and said, take us back to Egypt. Rahab simply heard of the stories, and hearing of the stories caused her to respond in faith. God's looking for people today that aren't afraid to respond in faith. You defeat your fear when you face the facts. You defeat your fear when you examine your circumstances and act accordingly, and then you resolve to be the one that makes a difference. That day, when the spies knocked on her door, Rahab was face to face with her fear, and she said, not anymore. We need to get to the place where we get so fed up with fear that we look it in the eyes and say, not anymore. Not on my watch. Not in my house. Not in my workplace. Not in my neighborhood. Not anymore, fear. You don't belong here. But Rahab didn't stop by facing her fear. She, she acted and responded in faith. And number two is the steps of faith that were evident in Rahab's life. You have to exchange your fear for faith. Otherwise, there's always room for fear. The more faith you have, the less room there is for fear to be a function in, function in your life. The first, the first step that Rahab took of faith is she focused on the truth. She focused on the truth. Joshua chapter 2 and verse 11 says, And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. Why? Because of this truth. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and the earth beneath. This wasn't an Israelite making this declaration. This is somebody who was tired of living in fear and said, I want to serve this God. He seems pretty exciting and powerful. Truth is truth and shouldn't change. What was true today, before the unexpected came knocking on your door, is still the truth when you come face to face with the unexpected. This is why it's important to focus on the truth. And if you struggle with the truth in, self, in several areas, then you need to start encouraging yourself with the scriptures. Get Wanda's book on words to pray by. There's a concordance there. You're struggling with something. It'll give you all these verses, all of these truths that can build your faith. Rahab had heard the truth concerning the Israelites' journey in the wilderness and was convinced of the miraculous power of God and willing to do something to make a difference. Keep in mind that knowledge of the truth is never sufficient. You have to be willing to take an action on it. Right? Sometimes in the church, we're really good at knowing what the proper response is. We're really good at knowing the answer, knowing what we're supposed to say, but we fail to walk it out. Rahab was all in, committed completely. You have to focus on the truth. Don't get sidetracked by the lies. Don't get sidetracked by the commentaries or the opinions. Don't get sidetracked by what you hope the truth to be. Focus on the truth. And then you acknowledge your priorities. You've identified the truth. You've focused on it. Now you need to acknowledge your priorities in light of that truth. Rahab realized what needed to happen. So she focused on her priority. What was her priority? To save herself. To not be destroyed like everyone else. In Joshua chapter 2 and verse 12, she says, Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, also, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign. After you've sorted out the truth from the lies, you've identified the fact from fiction, it's time to get back and acknowledge what is important and set your priorities based on the known truth. 
For Rahab, her safety and the safety of her family was her top priority, and she was, do, she was willing to do anything to keep them safe. You acknowledge your priorities. And then, if you're, if you're responding in faith, you have to be willing to increase your influence. Faith affects more than just you. See, when we respond in faith, our influence is increased. Uh, 13, uh, Joshua 2.13 says that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them. All right, Rahab knows she has the spy's attention and she's like, hey, listen, I want you to save me. I want you to save my mom and dad. I want you to save my brothers. I want you to save my sisters. I want you to save their spouses. Oh, don't forget my nieces and nephews. Save everybody who's in my house, God. Her influence is being increased. Faith causes you to stand up and stand out. Okay, in, in, in 2.24, Rahab made this declaration the second time. She says, um, or and, I'm sorry, in verse 24, what we have happening is the spies have returned home and they're reporting to Joshua what happened. And this is their report. Truly the Lord has given all the land into our hands. Also, all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. See, Rahab's faith encouraged the spies. And they encouraged the rest of the Israelites. God was about to come and give Joshua a heavenly download of a radical way that Jericho was going to be defeated. It was going to be defeated by obedience and shouting as they marched around and God would bring the walls down. And Rahab's testimony encouraged everyone. It built their faith to the point that when Joshua, didn't, when Joshua gave the instructions, they didn't say, yeah, I want to see that. They were like, all right, it's time. Let's go. Their faith had increased because Rahab increased her influence. Next thing we have to do is we have to trust in the promises of God. Trust in the promises of God. Joshua 2.14, the spies are talking to Rahab, and the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a promise to me. You spared our life, we'll spare your life. Or die trying. Pretty firm promise. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us this land, not if the Lord gives us this land, when the Lord gives us this land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Who are you putting your trust in today? See, we have to decide. Are we putting our trust in our bank account? Are we putting our trust in our business or our job? Are we putting our trust in our influence? Are we putting our trust in the government? Are we putting our trust in the church or our family or anything else? Or are we putting our trust in God? For the inhabitants of Jericho, they were putting all the trust in their walls and their gate. These walls were huge. No one had been able to get through them before. So they believed as long as we had enough food, we could shut the walls, we could close, or we could, we could close the gates and live behind the walls, and no one would be able to get through. But Rahab decided, I'm not going to trust in the strength of man. I'm not going to trust in the walls. I'm going to trust in the God who made heaven and earth. Where are we putting our trust today? Rahab chose to trust in the promise of the spies that God would honor her obedience and save her. The truth of the matter is, men will disappoint you. They may not mean to, but they'll disappoint you. They'll lie to you. Some will even deceive you. But the promises of God are sure and amen. That is why it is important that we trust his promises. If God has given you a promise, hold on to that promise. That's our last point. We have to hold on to the promises of God. Joshua 2.21 says, and she said, according to your words, so be it. Then she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in her window. She responded in obedience. When you've acted when you put yourself out there, it's time to buckle up because things more than likely will get rough. Somehow we get this thinking, if, if we're walking in faith, boy, it's, it's just easy. Everything just happens. God just moves right there. 
Sometimes he does. But a lot of times there's a lot of waiting. There's a lot of pause. In, in Joshua chapter 6 uh, and verse 22, the walls are falling. Joshua's giving instructions, he says, but to the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there the woman and all who belong to her, just as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her, and they brought all of her relatives and put them outside of the camp of Israel. Rahab and her entire household were saved. It's important that we realize this happened in chapter 6, at, at least three weeks later. Okay? So for three weeks, Rahab had to keep everyone in her house. For three weeks, she had her in-laws living with her. And I don't think she had a huge house. All right? For three weeks, the, niece, the nieces and nephews are saying, Why? Why? Why do we have to stay here? I want to go see my friends. For three weeks, she had opportunity to doubt. For three weeks, she had opportunity to return to her fear. But she held on to her faith, and she refused to not trust in the promises of God. See, we hold on to our faith when we enter into obedience. If you want to hold on to your faith, you have to be obedient. And partial obedience doesn't count. If God's told you to do something, no matter how small or how big or how weird it sounds, your responsibility is to obey. We hold on to our obedience when we exercise our faith. Trust me, when you're waiting for God to show up and do what he's promised to do, you will have ample opportunities to exercise your faith, to continue believing. You'll have well-meaning friends or family members speaking other things into your ears, and you have to decide, am I going to trust in the promises of God, or am I going to trust in the words of man? You have to hold on. You need to search the word. You need to stay in prayer. You need to surround yourself with people of faith because they can help build you up. And then if you're going to hold on, you have to be willing to encourage others. I'm sure there was many moments where Rahab was having to encourage her brothers and sisters and say, trust me, I looked into their eyes. We will be okay. We just have to wait. So we enter into obedience, we exercise our faith, and we encourage others. When we step out in faith, our actions encourage others. If we want to have a faith that is acting, then we need to respond as Rahab did in faith. And, and number three, the last thing I just want to say today is amazing faith produces amazing faith results. The bigger your faith, the bigger your results. But it, it's okay to start small. That's how God starts with a lot of us, baby steps. And then we're starting to take big leaps. Just think about that for a moment, how the right decision made at the right time had such an impact. Rahab was willing to risk everything when she stepped away from the window of fear and doubt and walked through the doorway of faith and possibilities. Only God could orchestrate such an amazing turn of events for an obscure individual that was willing to take the leap and trust in the God that made the heavens and the earth and become the one that changed her circumstances. Hollywood couldn't write this. But God could not only write it, he could orchestrate it in time so that everything happened as it was supposed to happen. That the spies would knock on her door, that she would be willing to respond in kind to them, that she would hide them, that she would divert the, the soldiers, that she would help them to escape, that she would have influence and gather her family into her house, and she would keep them there, waiting for God to fulfill the promise, day after day, waiting, wondering, is to Today the day. There's no way that Rahab could have ever imagined when she answered that door and laid the spies down on the roof and started covering them up what would take place that day. 
while the rest of her people were frozen in fear, she would become the one person to make a difference. That the stories that she heard growing up about those people living on the other side of the Jordan River would so affect her that at one point in time, she would be willing to risk everything, deny her people, deny her way of life, deny everything and leave everything behind and embrace the truth of the God who made heavens and earth. One day, not only would she be saved, but she would get an opportunity to meet their God and see his power firsthand. Imagine the excitement stirring in Rahab's house as the shouts of the Israelite soldiers and the trumpets were beginning to be heard and the walls all around them began to crumble. And I'm sure she held her breath to see what would happen to her house. But her house stood while the rest of the walls came down as soldiers ushered into the city and killed everybody in the city. Other spies crawled through her window and escorted her family out to safety. Rahab, could you ever imagine that that would happen? Rahab, did you think that when all of that happened, that you would be welcomed into the Israelites, that you would marry an Israelite, and you would have a son who would grow up waiting for the right woman to come, and God would bring Ruth, another outsider, to her. And they would be married, and she would become part of your family. And within three generations, that there would be this shepherd boy out keeping watch of the, sh watch of the sheep, and that... Samuel would come and anoint him as king over Israel. Rahab, could you imagine that your great-great-grandson would become the greatest natural king that Israel ever had? All because one day when the unexpected came knocking on your door, you were willing to respond in faith. But her story doesn't stop there. Her actions so inspired others. She's, given, she's listed as an example two times in the New Testament because of her faith an outsider who became a convert, who is found today in the bloodline of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, all because when everyone else around her accepted the status quo and lived in fear, and she said, not me. She said, not my house. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make a difference. And she made a difference. Rahab, could you imagine that this would all be possible because your actions in one day would change your life forever? The challenge that comes from the life of Rahab is that God can do amazing things. We just have to be willing to become the one through which he accomplishes them. You know, sometimes we're guilty about saying, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you should do that. That would be great for you. We can point the fingers how everyone else should respond when God wants us thinking about how we should respond. Because as long as we have breath, it's never too late to become the one. What's holding you back today? What unexpected thing keeps knocking on your door, causing you to pull the covers over your head? How has fear kept you from experiencing the fullness of God's best for your life? What's keeping you from becoming the one that faces the facts, that examines the circumstances, that acts accordingly and resolves to rise out of the ashes of fear and hopelessness and embrace the impossibility, the one who turns their fear into faith? I want to invite everyone to stand. And I just want to ask you this, this simple question. Are you ready to respond in faith to the unexpected? Are you ready to focus on the facts and God's words and not the opinions of man? Are you ready to take the time to look at what's really important to you and acknowledge your priorities and say, what can I do to make the difference? 
Are you ready to increase your influence? Faith never acts in a vacuum. Others are always involved in our journey of faith. Are you ready to trust in the promises of God? And then hold on. Hold on. Maybe you're, you're hearing these stories today. And you're like Rahab was when the spies first knocked on the door. I've heard of you, God. But I'm not satisfied with hearing. I'm not satisfied with just knowing that you have a plan and a purpose. I want you to be Lord of my life. I want to exchange my doubt and my hopelessness and my inadequacies for your plans and purposes, God. I want to allow you to take control and lead me where you want to go. If that's you, I just invite you to raise your hand. We'd love to pray with you. If you're, if you're ready to make that difference, thank you. Thank you. I just want to invite you, and I invite everyone to go ahead and pray with me. It's, it's never bad. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for having a plan for me. I'm tired of trying to do it on my own. And I'm willing to just set aside my fear and my doubt and make you Lord of my life. The God of heaven and earth is who I will put my trust in today. Come and live inside of me, Lord. And teach me how to hear your voice. And give me the faith to walk in your purpose. Amen. Amen. Um, Nick's going to.